Hey guys, Spirit of the Law here. Welcome to part two of a series where we'll go through one mildly interesting trivia fact about each civilization in Age of Empires 2. Just like last time, this could be an especially unusual tech tree combination they have, a little known or obscure hidden effect for a bonus, or just a historical curiosity. The only rule is that it has to be mildly interesting, no more and no less. Last time we made it up to Koreans, so we're gonna continue right where we left off, this time with the Lithuanians. They were heralded as the ultimate Tudan busting civilization, with their unique unit ignoring armor, basically negating the Tudans' extra armor bonus, as well as their Teutonic Knight. As it turns out though, in reality Tudans have become consistently one of the Lithuanian's five worst matchups in 1v1 Arabia. The Tudans' strong economy and resistance to conversion no doubt play a role in that, as well as the difficulty amassing latest in a 1v1 game, but it's definitely not what anyone expected when the Lithuanians were announced. Moving on to the Magyars, one of their challenges is always their lack of an eco bonus, depending on whether you include the scout discount as an eco bonus or not. What's interesting though is in the original Forgotten Empires mod, they did have an eco bonus, which was free hunting dogs. If that tech doesn't sound familiar, it's because it was later removed from the game, though at one point it was a very cheap tech in Dark Age, giving hunters and fishermen 25% faster work speed. Ultimately, the tech ended up just being unpopular for a few reasons, as it rewarded boar stealing, it enhanced the benefit of good map generation with close deer, and also encouraged players to make a mill before a lumber camp to prioritize it, and it just ended up being cut without anything additional given to Magyars. Next up from Malay, this one's quite simply that they're unique as the only sieve with Bombard Tower, usually associated with good defenses, that is in fact also missing fortified walls. You could still make walls of Bombard Towers, and that might work even better, though it sounds a little expensive. Either way, it's a very odd combination for a university to have. Now, as for the Malians, their interesting fact is they're the only sieve with access to every single tech and non-regional unit up to Castle Age, obviously excluding regional units like the Eagle Warrior, of course. Even Saracens, with their very open tech tree, are still missing heated shot and stone shaft mining but Malians have as open of a tech tree as you can possibly get until Imperial Age. Of course, the flip side is Malians end up with Arblasters who are lacking Bracer, which is a little awkward, and they're in fact also unique as the only civilization with that unfortunate combination. Lacking Bracer in general is actually quite uncommon with newer civilizations, and after four of the original 13 civs were missing that tech, only three out of the 29 expansion civilizations since then have been lacking it. One reason for that could be that removing Bracer doesn't just impact archers, but also the range on defensive buildings, making it more punishing to remove than it might seem at a glance. Moving on to the Mayans, we'll mix it up a bit with a historical tidbit for this one. In this case, El Dorado, which is the name of their Imperial Age unique tech, actually has nothing historically to do with the Mayans. It's of course a mythical city of gold that inspired several expeditions in the late 1500s with the best guess of the Spaniards at the time thinking it was in modern Colombia, Venezuela, or Brazil, which again has nothing to do with the Mayans being at best a thousand miles or more reasonably 1500 miles away from the closest Mayan border at their zenith. It's also not totally clear what this has to do with adding 40 HP to Eagle Warriors, which were also incidentally an infantry class within Aztec society as well, and again nothing to do with the Mayans. I'm sorry to say it, but it's just a bit of a confused tech. Now as for the Mongols, they're maybe best known in the late game at least for their S tier unique unit, the Mangadai. Despite all of its advantages and good reputation though, the Mangadai has one very odd fact about it, which is that it's the only unique unit where its elite upgrade at the castle doesn't improve its HP. Instead, the elite upgrade just gives more attack, melee armor, and more bonus damage against Siege. Moving on now to the Persians, interestingly, they're in fact the only civilization with just two civ bonuses, three if you include the team bonus, but either way, they have the fewest. This mostly just goes to show that in Age of Empires 2, all you really need is one good eco bonus to make a civ competitive. In case you're wondering, the opposite extreme is the Tudans, with six civ bonuses. Though, of course, we all know it's not about how many bonuses you have, but how you use them. Next up for the Poles, as we all know, their villagers recover HP at a staggered rate through the ages, which is helpful for lots of things, including tower rushes and surviving raids. One wrinkle the bonus doesn't mention, though, is it has the restriction that it only activates once your first town center is up. That means on Nomad, even if you could get into a scrappy fight with enemy villagers, you wouldn't have that bonus helping you, presumably to avoid that exact situation ever coming up and punishing players who try to get too cheeky. 
Now, as for the Portuguese, you probably know already that researching arquebus makes their gunpowder units more accurate, essentially by giving them ballistics so they can hit moving targets. Another lesser known side effect not mentioned though is it also increases the projectile speed of hand cannoneers, bombard cannons, and cannon galleons, so that enemy units have less time to change direction and dodge those more accurate projectiles. In addition to that, it also gives the bombard tower projectiles a hidden extra speed boost of 7%, despite saying it only applies to gunpowder units. Admittedly, mentioning all of this would make for a very long in-game tech tree description, so I bring this up more to highlight the attention to detail more than anything else. Moving on to the Saracens, just a quick note here in a similar very technical vein is that their plus two foot archer versus building team bonus not only applies to the archer line and foot archer unique units, as the write-up suggests, but also maybe surprisingly to skirmishers and slingers as well, which are placed in the same foot archer category. Next up for the Sicilians, a sometimes overlooked side effect of First Crusade is that in addition to creating sergeants from your town centers as its main effect, it also has a secondary effect, giving your units extra conversion resistance. It's not immediately clear how much resistance that is, and in fact, it turns out to be the same amount as researching faith, but for a lower cost. The interesting fact here is that since Sicilians also have faith available, after researching both of those, they end up with more conversion resistance than any other civilization's units. This has helped out even more with a Tudin ally, but Sicilians were already number one without that team bonus. As a side note, this is one of the main reasons that Sicilian Cavaliers can be so strong in the late game, as between negating some anti-cavalry bonus damage, higher pierce armor than paladins, and the highest conversion resistance in the game, it can be hard to find a good counter unit if they're being spammed against you. Now, as for the Slavs, especially since the Indian civilization was broken up into four, Slavs have received some criticism for being too large of a cultural umbrella, competing at this point with Bulgarians, Bohemians, and Poles for what they represent. A little AOE2 history tidbit though is that according to a Forgotten Empires blog, Slavs weren't the original idea for the civilization, and instead they were originally planned to be the Scythians. While they do make an appearance in the Attila the Hun campaign, it was eventually decided that Scythians felt too out of place for the time period. And in case you're curious, the other Forgotten Empire civs planned originally were the Lombards, Tibetans, Incas, and Magyars, which were tweaked slightly into the five civilizations we eventually got. Moving on to the Spanish, something unique and pretty cool is that they remain the only civilization with fully upgradable trash units, meaning Halberdier, Skirmisher, and Hazar. With 42 civilizations in the game, you would think that combination would have happened again by chance for one civilization or another, but every other civ is missing at least one of the relevant technologies. Next up for the Tatars, commonly the Hazar or Cavalry Archer are parts of their late game army, so it's not a huge deal, but as a bit of an odd fact about them, they're unique for being the only civilization without heresy or faith, meaning if their knights or Keshiks are being converted, you don't have a technology available to help deal with that at all. Like I said, this isn't usually a big deal in practice considering your available unit compositions, and in fairness, I doubt many players would research faith even if it was there, but it still makes them unique. Moving on to the Teutons, you probably know already that they're the only civilization that has the Scout Cavalry, but can't upgrade it to the Light Cavalry. You might assume that makes it a terrible choice, but there's actually several Light Cavalry and even some Hazar that they can beat one-on-one. -on -one. That's thanks to having Bloodlines, all the Blacksmith techs, and extra melee armor. They definitely don't have the worst Light Cavalry line, despite how they look at a glance, though I wouldn't necessarily say they're good, they're just maybe a little better than expected. Now, as for the Turks, they weren't always special for this, but as of now, Elite Janissary is the only land unique unit with zero frame delay, meaning they instantly attack when given a new target instead of having a scripted pause as part of their animation. This makes them especially smooth to micro, and while in the past there have been several unique units with this attribute, and it's still true for many naval units, all of the unique units on land have since been nerfed, with Elite Janissary as the lone standout left. Coming up near the end now, we have the Vietnamese. In this case, despite the Imperial Skirmisher being highlighted in purple in the tech tree, which usually signals something is a unique unit, the Samurai's anti-unique unit bonus damage has no effect on it. The most obvious explanation, and something you might assume then, is that the Samurai only has bonus damage against castle unique units. But on the flip side, the Condottiero, as another team unit, does take Samurai bonus damage. So obviously team units are sometimes affected. Maybe even more surprising then, the Imperial Camel Rider does not take Samurai bonus damage, despite being arguably the most unique out of the three here, belonging solely to the Hindustanis. 
The rule of thumb seems to be that unique upgrades to generic units don't count as unique units for samurai purposes, though the Kondotiro as a standalone unit has that weakness. In fairness, if samurai gained a bonus against Imperial Skirmishers or Imperial Camels, it could punish or deter players from upgrading an otherwise generic unit, and the way it's done seems easiest to avoid that situation entirely. And finally, for the Vikings. You might remember this from my Through the Ages series if you saw it, but I think it's interesting enough to repeat. In the alpha version of Age of Kings, long before release, there was quite a different idea about how longboats would work, where originally they were going to allow garrisoned units, obviously like a transport ship, but also able to fight other ships. In fact, this idea stuck around right into the beta, and would have made a lot of historical sense, given longboats were what Vikings used to travel for their raids, though for some reason it was dropped before the official release. So that concludes the two-part mini-series of mildly interesting facts. Even if none of it comes in handy in a practical situation, hopefully it gives you a few little tidbits to think about when playing different civilizations. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.